If you have an interest in horses and love learning more about horses, the horse industry, teaching, or even managing your own horse business, then you're in the right place. We would love you to join us on our mission, which is to improve the lives of horses around the world through the education of riders, handlers, and trainers. So get comfortable, listen in, and enjoy. This has been another episode sponsored by Online Horse College. If you haven't had a look at the wide variety of equine-specific accredited courses, then go to onlinehorsecollege.com and I'll see you over there. Before I introduce our guest today, Jessica Ray, I'm going to tell you about our sponsor, Sophie Barrington at Archer Creative. They're the experts in equine business marketing. If you're looking for something to welcome your prospects, you know, something that's high powered in the website design, talk to Sophie. You can go to horsechats.com, search for Archer Creative or search for Sophie and you'll find her contact details. Now I'm introducing Jess. How are you today, Jess? I'm very well, thank you, Glennis. Good. Now, Jess, I didn't warn you before, but we are going to throw out what's your favourite quote. Have you got one for us? Uh, I don't have a favourite quote as such. I, I did read something the other day that I wrote down because I liked it. Yep. And it says, success is no accident. It is hard work, perseverance, learning, studying, sacrifice, and most of all, love of what you are doing or learning to do. And I really liked that, so I, I thought that that applies to what I do, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm sure there's people that look at you and say, wow, Jess is so lucky. She's riding, she's competing, she's got a team of horses. She is so lucky. Yeah. Yes, I get. I do get that one a lot, <laughs> all the time. Yes. And especially when people who aren't horsey ask you what you do and you tell them and they think, oh, that's, that's amazing, that's a dream job. And it is, it is. I'm, I love what I do, but it, it is hard work and it's been hard work from the moment I decided to do it. Mm, mm. Tell us then one of your early memories. You know, the first time you got on a horse maybe, the first time you did something, something that you learned. Just tell us one of those early sure. memories. Well, I was very fortunate. I grew up on a farm out near Mudgee and so I've been around horses from – before I could walk and I I used to be put on the back of a horse and my dad would lead me around while he was mustering sheep and that was yeah before I could even walk really um, but I have really good memories of my brother and sister and I riding around the farm when we were young chasing sheep and swimming in the dams and that, that's some of the earliest things I can remember was just riding around the paddocks and probably being a little bit wild. <laughs> <laughs> and when you were chasing the sheep and swimming in the dam with you and your brother, what horse were you riding? You know, was there a specific horse that you used to ride then? Yeah, I had a really great pony that I learned to ride on called Misty. She was Palomino and she was an absolute gem. And then I learned to ride on her, then my sister, then my brother. And, and then she was sold on to another family who all learned to ride on her. So she was very special. We were lucky to have her. Yeah, ponies like that, they are their dreams, aren't they? They really are. Mm -hmm. Now, going from that, Jess, to have a career where you're with horses now, you're coaching, riding, training, what sort of stepped you in that direction? Was it one decision, a series of decisions? Well, when I left school, I decided to have a year off and I decided to spend that year off working for Gordon Bishop, who at the time was based at Lock and Var with yes. um, and Robbie Ryan. And I'd always ridden through school, but I wouldn't say I did it full time or really considered it the thing I wanted to do with my life. But I knew I didn't want to go to uni straight away, so I decided to have a year off and work for Gordon. And I really enjoyed that year and I got a lot out of it and then when it came to the end of the year and I had to decide whether to go back to uni or not I decided I didn't <laughs> want to go back to uni and I was going to have another year there and then from that one job led to another and I um well I'm now 12 years since I left school and I still haven't gone back <laughs> to uni. <laughs> All right. Now think about the skills that you had you know, when you first went to Gordon, it made him say, right, well, you know, stay here and then stay another year and someone else to offer you a job. If you were 
looking Mm -hmm. to employ someone, what sort of core skills or character traits would you need for them to work in the horse industry? I think number one, you have to be prepared to work hard. There's just no job I can think of in the horse industry that isn't hard and there's early mornings, late nights, physical work. Um, I, that's number one. And then I think you've, you've really got to want to do it and you've got to love horses and, and want to make a life with horses. Otherwise, it's horrible. <laughs> Otherwise, it's not a fun thing to do. Um, and I think, well, from my own personal experience, Having, showing a bit of initiative and and being able to think for yourself and make decisions, that's a real bonus. Um, But yeah, I really think most of all, you've got to be able to be prepared to work, be prepared to listen and enjoy what you do. Okay, good, good. And I think that's good advice for anyone, you know, especially breaking it down to those few things, yeah. What's the best thing about working in the horse industry? Um, I, I really, I've, I feel like over the years I've been fortunate to meet a lot of different people and and that's through horses, but they may not necessarily be people that ride horses or own horses. So I I really enjoy getting to meet a lot of different people from different walks of life. I also love the fact that I get to go outside every day and and work with my animals. I love being outside. Um, I obviously love horses and every day is different. there's no day that's the same. You know, you ride a different horse, your horse will go differently. It's it's different all the time. And I often think, you know, I've, I've actually just been overseas for a few weeks on a bit of a holiday and, and people say, oh, you know, you're dreading going back to work. I actually, I've never gone away and not wanted to come home and, and work or ride horses. And I think that's a really good positive sign. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, people talk about lots of different careers, but I think it's out on its own myself. <laughs> All right. Yeah, yeah. Now, you talked about Gordon about taking that year off school mm. and he was at Lock and Bar. Did Heath and Rosie Ryan have much of an influence on you and help you in your career or was it more focused with Gordon then? Well, I think they they all did really. It was a really amazing place to be and I'm so grateful for my time there. So obviously Gordon was, um, you know, I worked for Gordon. He was a great influence on me. Gordon's a wonderful horseman. He broke in a lot of horses when I was there and I learned so much from him just about, you know, basic horsemanship and I watched him deal with difficult horses all the time and, you know, even just watching him load difficult horses. I learned a lot from him. Heath and Rosie were always there. They they were always um, supportive of me. I mean, anyone that knows Heath knows he's the most passionate person around and he would do anything for his students. Um, yep, yep, so it was a wonderful yep. environment to be in. I, I I had great people around me. And for me, it was a real eye-opener because I'd come from a bit of a pony club farm background and I didn't know much about, you know, performance horses or high-level competition or managing horses. So I really learned a lot from that experience and I also made good contacts that you know led on to future jobs and and other things to come so Mm -hmm. it was really really exciting place to be good good now what about horses have you got a special horse now I know that you're preparing to go to Adelaide and you've got a couple of horses one that's going in the two star one in the three star tell us about those horses or tell us about one horse that you think's been a standout that's really helped you in your career Sure. Well, I'm I'm really lucky at the moment that I'm actually I've got the best horses I've ever had, or the best horses I've been sitting on. And um, you mentioned my three star horse uh, Rascal. He he's a bit special to me because he's the first horse I actually bred. Um, he's been a oh big learning curve over the years. It hasn't been easy. He was certainly not an easy young horse. Um, and at the time when he was young, I didn't really have much else and I persevered with him. And looking back, if I if I had the same horse now, I don't know if I would have. He, he wasn't showing a lot of talent back then, but that was an interesting thing for me to learn that it just goes to show that sometimes if you persevere that, you know, they do end up being good horses. So he's, 
he's been one I'm really proud of and and he's a good horse and I'm looking forward to seeing what he can do. Um, the mare I own who's two star, she, she's amazing and she's teaching me a lot about dealing with mares. Yes. <laughs> but I also have a, a wonderful horse who is my first three star horse and um, he – he was a horse that came along basically because no one else wanted to ride him. And I sort of jumped at the opportunity because I, I didn't have the money to buy a good horse. I didn't really have any good horses at the time. And he he was a really difficult horse. He was hot. He was strong. But he was the bravest horse I'll ever ride. And he gave me a real taste of what it was like to compete at three-star level and and, you know, I, I just feel so fortunate that he came along when he did. And I think it it really made me decide that this is what I wanted to do for forever. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. What do you think your proudest moment was? Um, I, I've had a, a few over the years, but recently I'd say my, my best results to date, I finished second in the CCI three-star at Melbourne three-day event and my mare finished fifth in the CCI two star, and that was that was definitely my best results I've had. And I was just really pleased with my horses and how everything had sort of come right at the right time for me. And yeah, I was I was really happy with that. Mm-hmm. So getting them ready for that competition for Melbourne, you know, having the two horses, and you probably had other horses that you were working in lessons and keeping it all busy. But what do you think your biggest challenge was actually getting to Melbourne? Uh, quite often for me, it's um, I own my horses, which is great because I call all the shots, I guess, but it's expensive. Um, and quite often it's it's a bit of a balance for me working out, you know, how many lessons I can have, exactly what I can afford to do with them um, and, you know, still be able to pay for my entry fees and get to the event. So, look, really in the scheme of things, I had very smooth sailing leading into that event. My horses were fit. I had the prep I needed before it. But it's, I've always, I guess the financial situation is always a bit of a challenge for me just and I probably I don't have as many lessons as I like um because I'm a little worried about that sometimes Mm -hmm. but Mm -hmm. really I'm pretty lucky with everything I've got so I'm not going to complain too much good good (laughs) because you know it's like saying I can't afford this and this and this but some people are saying I can't even afford a horse you know, exactly. so so you've got to look at it and say, well, if I look at it in the big scheme of things, I'm yeah, I'm doing pretty good. That's right. Yeah. I definitely am. I'm very fortunate. Yeah, yeah. Now, thinking about you as a coach, and I know you teach all three phases. Mm-hmm. If you were um, going out to do a clinic or to go and teach, what's the most common fault that you see within dressage, and how can people fix it? Um, I think. In dressage, a lot of what I see, I guess I teach a lot of, um, you know, younger people and and I really like teaching them and they're super keen, but everyone's in a bit of a hurry when you're young and I was. I've I've definitely been there and and you want things to be good and you want things to be good now. And and I think sometimes people probably... uh, rush their horses or put pressure on their horses or too much pressure on their horses. So I I guess I would say that, you know, you've you've really got to listen to your horse and and what it's telling you and and take your time, learn to do things correctly, get good help as well as good a help as you can get and, and just really put all the steps into place. Um, you know, like I said, I, I was definitely one of those young people who was trying to do half pass before I could even trot in a straight line. But I do I do think that that's a common thing that people are in a rush, you know, they want their horse to be round and they want it to go like this and but it's so important that they're trained correctly from from the word go to get the best result. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think so. I'm just sort of thinking, does that transfer across to show jumping? 
You know, you've talked about dressage yeah. and you've talked about people being in a hurry there. Is that the same? Absolutely, yeah. And, and again, like the, the flat work is so important. I think quite often, um, oh, again, I'm, I'm, you know, I've done all these things. <laughs> we just want to go out and we want to jump and we want to jump bigger. And, and yeah, cantering in a straight line to a jump is impossible, but you want to jump a metre 20. So I think, yeah, absolutely. The flat work is so important. You have to have good basics. You know, you really have to try and do everything correctly rather than try and rush up the level. What specific exercises? You know, say you've got someone who does come in, they want to jump a metre 20. Yeah. What specific exercises do you not just give them while you're teaching them, but then give them and say, work on this in between so that by the next lesson you can do it? Yeah, sure. Uh, I'm a real stickler for straightness. Mm -hmm. Or anyone that I teach will tell you I drill them about that and and quite often I will just put out two poles you know maybe four or five strides apart and they have to be able to canter in a perfect perfectly straight line over the very middle of those poles so that's something I use I use that with my baby horses I do that with my three-star horse, but I have to be able to canter in a dead straight line, whether it be a pole, a cross rail, anything. But that's, yeah, that's probably one of my number one things that I reinforce to my students. And that's probably a good one. Like show jumping, you can get around because the wings are there and the, from one wing to the other, it's a pretty wide space to jump. But coming to cross country, we've got to get a bit more technical. Mm, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I think the more that I, um, I guess, ride at a high level or two or three star level, the more I realise that it's so important that the horse just has to jump. You know, if you were to draw a dot on the jump, it has to. You have to be able to get it to jump over that dot because in two and three star, we often have apexes, skinny fences, and, and there's just no margin for error. You know, they can't they can't have a left drift or a right drift. They have to stay dead straight and they have to be on your aids and jump where you tell them to jump. Mm. Mm. So if you're teaching someone who's coming in and saying, my horse is running out, you know, and every time there's a skinny in, in a, an event, my horse runs out, what sort of exercises? Is that much the same as what you were saying in show jumping? Yeah, I guess so. And I guess you've got to get to the, you know, why, why is the horse running out? Is the horse running out because it, it's learnt to drift? Is the horse running out because it's scared of the jump um, or it's been over face? But I I think um, I learnt, Prue Barrett possibly I has reinforced this to me, but you would rather have a horse stop in front of a jump than learn to run out. Once they learn to run out, it's a lot harder to fix. So I would, um, you know, if I had a horse that had a, a problem where it was running out one way, I, I would actually spend some time trotting in. We we do this sometimes at a, at a squad clinic for with our three-star horses. You know, if we have a skinny fence, we'll, we'll trot in, we'll walk, and we'll walk up to the fence and then stop right in the middle. So just so that they, they realise that that's, that's the line. That's where they have to go. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, you've got to be like this isn't something I would say everyone go home and do this because you've got to be a little careful when you're doing this that the horse doesn't think that you're actually expecting it to jump the jump from a walk. Um, but I, I think it, yeah, I, I think it's important that if the horse runs out, that it it begins to learn that that's not an option and that it, you'd actually rather that it stop in front of the jump. And the other thing I see a little bit is the, you know, a horse will run out. It'll run out to the left and then they'll turn left and do a 50-metre circle. Yeah, <laughs> if yeah. it runs out to the left, you know, you pull the right rein and you mm-hmm. turn it right. Yep. And it, I'm, I get quite angry about those things sometimes. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, no, I can understand that. Yeah, it's frustrating. Yeah, yeah. Look, I think the really good advice there was ask why. You know, you like you gave yeah. some great advice as far as correcting and keeping your horse on the line and keeping them in the centre. But when you said 
if your horse is doing this, ask why. I think that's just yeah. invaluable. And I think right through all the phases, it, through every sort of training, you know, or even on the ground, if your horse is doing it, ask why. Why are they doing it? Why have they learned to do that? You know, what can you do to prevent it and stop it happening again? Yeah, yeah. Definitely, yeah. definitely. Yeah. I think it's it's so important. You know, you have you have to listen to your horses and you have to, if if they're getting upset about a certain exercise, what what is it about that exercise that's upset them? Like you've you've always got to be thinking why why they don't understand this or why they don't like it. Are they scared? Have they lost confidence? Mm. Um, yeah. So even when you you know when you're sort of preparing a horse for a big event and maybe the work's harder and they start to feel a little tired, like. You've just got to know know what them well enough to know how they're feeling and know when to back off as well, I think. Yep, 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 yep. No, that's good. If you're an equestrian coach or a horse riding instructor, or even if you aspire to be one, have a look at the free video series for horse riding instructors on the Horse Chats website. Go there now. Have a look. Horsechats.com. All right. Now, what about books? Have you got a book that you'd like to recommend, one that's helped you along the lines of your training and one that you think might help some of our listeners? Well, I have to be honest, I'm not a great reader. I, I used to be and I wish I was, but I'm not. But I, when I was younger, I read Jill Rolton's book. Yes, and I know. Yep. I, yes, and I remember um, just thinking I, I just loved it and I, I used to probably – try and make my horses at the time who really couldn't do it do her fitness <laughs> plan that she wrote. And, but I, I was really inspired by Jill Rolton when I was growing up, and I still think that's a great read. She, mm, she was mm. one tough lady. Yep. Um, so I, I always recommend that. But as far as um, uh, learning, I, I often read articles by, um, you know, by Carl Hester yep. or um, – Oh, Ingrid, Ingrid Klimkin, she's a great one. And, and I just, I take bits and pieces from different people, I guess. There's not probably one book I'd recommend, but I think read read those articles and, and, you know, if you see a trainer and you like how they ride or you like how their horse goes, read some of the things that they've written because, you know, you can just pick up little things from those articles and it, and it might really help you. Mm-hmm. I think that's good. And remember, you can find all the books recommended by our guests at horsechats.com slash books. You can have a look at the guest page for the individual book they recommended or just look at the recommended books by order of popularity at horsechats.com slash books. Now, I know you're looking forward to Adelaide. You've got a few other events coming up. Is that the main things that you're looking forward to? Have you got any young horses coming along? Yeah, I, I've got... um. I've always got young horses coming along. <laughs> I've um, <laughs> I, I I enjoy breeding a little bit, so I've actually I I breed one one foal most years. So I've always sort of got horses coming along. I've got a horse at the moment I bred who's uh, by Higgins, and he's competing pre novice. And I'm actually thinking that he'll go one star at his next start at Syac. So yes, I I really enjoy um bringing my young horses along and. And seeing how how they turn out, so I've got the the young ones. I've got the two, I guess, good ones, and we've got a few events coming up: Syac events in a couple of weeks, and then uh, probably looking to Golden and Albury, and then yes, aiming towards Adelaide okay. with um, Rascal in Brooklyn. Yep. Yep. All right. Now, Jess, think about your philosophy with horses and see if you can sum that up just in a couple of sentences. Sure. That's a tough one. <laughs> um. <laughs> I think we've got, you know, I mean, you're very much with you asking why and things like that all the way through and and listening, listening to your horse. But you summarise it. It might be something completely different, but um, you summarise it and tell me. Yeah. Look, I think I think along the lines of what you just said, I I think you've really got to know your horse, understand your horse and um and listen to what's going on. Um but I also think over the years a big thing for me has been put in the work, do the training, be organized, don't go to an event, you know, having never cross country school, be organized, do all the work you can. And that's how you get good results. Okay. I think that's good. 
All right, Jess, if someone would like to contact you and um, organise a lesson or clinics or anything or offer to sponsor your next three-star horse, well, how can they contact you? <laughs> sure. I, I'm, uh, I can be contacted on via phone on 0429-052067. Also email jess underscore 543 at hotmail.com. And quite often, Facebook Messenger is also a good way to get me as well. Good. And those contact details will be on horsechats.com slash Jessica Ray. That's R-A-E. Or go to horsechats.com, search for Jessica or search for Ray. Good to talk to you, Jess. Really enjoyed this. Really enjoyed the training tips. Yeah, good. All right. And hopefully we'll catch up with you again sometime soon. Okay. So thank you. Great. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Now, if you're still there, you probably know that I'm absolutely passionate about education within the horse industry. That's why I host this podcast. My other venture is Online Horse College. Have a look now at onlinehorsecollege.com and I'll see you over there. Remember that our comments and instructions are general in nature and do not take into consideration your individual horses or your individual ability and circumstances. If you enjoyed this podcast, then please leave your comment below.